Okay, this is going to be the second uh, lecture on nesting in birds. We've talked about the different types of nests as far as kind of uh, architecturally what, what kind they are. Open cup nests, um, scrapes, um, and within open cup we can talk about statened versus uh, pensile and pendulous. And then we talked about cavity nesting being primary and secondary and, and domed and burrows. Um, now let's talk about what birds actually make their nests out of. Vegetation plays a big role as far as sticks and grasses. Um, mud can also be used, uh, particularly in regard to the adherent uh, cup nests. And, and when I'm talking about these being separate, clearly many of these are used in combination. Lichens are oftentimes used as uh, ways of camouflaging the nest on the outside of the nest. Feathers and hair are oftentimes lining uh, one of the last materials added to a nest and, and put into the interior lining. Uh, and that provides some cushioning for the eggs, but also it provides greater, greater thermal capabilities when one of the incubators leaves so that the eggs don't lose heat uh, as quickly. Some other materials include uh, fungi. As a matter of fact, up in this top right corner, this fungus, uh, when the uh, cap is removed, it actually looks very hair-like. And so some of the earlier nests described as having hair in them, it actually turns out it was um, these uh, uh, fungal fibers. Spider silk is an important material used to bind a uh, certain nest together, uh, very commonly seen in hummingbirds, for example. Snake skins uh, are oftentimes a late addition in the nest of many flycatchers. And there's various hypotheses for why uh, these snake skins were added. It could be a sexually selected trait. Um, snake skins are not easy to find, and so if a female is wanting to find the quality of a male, one of the things she could do is, is how good is he at finding things? Um, and something like a snake skin would be a big challenge. Now, why would that be relevant? Well, again, if you're going to be a, a co-parent and needing to find food, having that ability um, to find something rare um, would be impressive. Second potential factor associated with why snake skins may be put on there is to scare off potential predators, something that might be scared of a snake, um, uh, certain mammalian predators, or maybe snakes themselves. Um, studies have indicated that uh, when snake skins are removed from half of the nest in a population of certain flycatchers, uh, or experimentally manipulated to have or not have uh, snake skins. Those with snake skins, there is some suggestion that it does provide some uh, a predator uh, protection. Lastly, saliva is a big component in the nest of a few species. The cave swiftlets of South uh, East Asia um, make a nest composed almost entirely of their uh, saliva, and it's part of the, the uh, ingredients for bird's nest soup. So diversity of materials are used. Birds can find these in various uh, aspects of their environment, but they'll oftentimes steal um, the materials from other competing nests. This has a double-fold advantage. One, it reduces the reproductive success of your competitors, uh, but then also it just makes it easier to you to, to find these resources than finding them on your own if you steal them from your neighbor. Artificial nests well, artificial materials are oftentimes incorporated in nests. Here is a, a crow nest that is composed in large part of wire from um, coat hangers. Um, corvids are pretty good at doing this. Um, certain nests of, of ravens have been found to be uh, have a large part uh, incorporated with barbed wire. Um, where I went to school at Angelo State University in San Angelo, Texas, uh, Bullock's Orioles would nest shortly after Easter, and they would oftentimes incorporate, um, at this one park near the lake, they would incorporate fishing line, for one, in their pendulous nest, but they would also take the plastic Easter grass that had been dropped by um, picnickers from the, from the previous Easter uh, egg hunts, and they would incorporate that bright, flashy, plastic grass into their nest and it made their nest really easy to find um, for, for people that are looking for them um, but also apparently was a nice material to weave into their nest. 
one species that is particularly uh, impressive as far as their sowing abilities is the common tailor birds. They will actually take leaves, green leaves together, sew them, and here you can see the individual uh, puncture marks where the stitches have been put through on this leaf to bind leaves together to make a little pocket that they then will uh, produce an egg. So it provides excellent camouflage uh, for the, these birds. Um, some, some birds uh, will use um, various materials, hair and grasses, to form some very elaborate knots in construction of domed structures like these weavers here. So who actually builds the nest? It varies from species to species. In most polygynous species and, and uh, promiscuous species, it's typically the female that does all the work. And then it's the, exactly the opposite in polyandrous species. The males end up building the nest, the female lays the egg in there, and then he takes care of them. So in those species, it's, it's uh, taken care of uh, typically just by one individual. In monogamous species, both in male and female are oftentimes involved in uh, building the nest. And in some regards, it is part of the courtship ritual itself. The male may build uh, several potential nests, kind of the crude structure, and then the female will choose which one they will nest at, uh, and then they'll work together to finish that nest out, or sometimes she will finish it on her own. Um, but it's part of the, the courtship ritual. Males may stick with their female during the process of nest formation because that may be her most fer fertile period. And so it serves not only as a, a means of, of a bonding with the female, but also as mate guarding to make sure there's no extra pair copulations. Um, sometimes females will judge the quality of a nest if the male does most of the building of that nest to as an extension of his own quality. So weavers build these very complex uh, woven uh, dome uh, structures as shown here. It's a very elaborate process and the females will actually land on these before the, any of the finished lining is put in and she'll actually try to tear it apart. She'll yank on it and pull on it um, and judge the quality of the construction and if it's very solidly put together then she can finish that nest up and, and will mate with uh, that male. In many wrens, uh, the males will produce many, many nests, and this is, again, a, a sign of his quality, his health, and as an honest signal that he is a quality individual, so the female may want to mate with him. That's one of the reasons why you might want to mate multiple nests, but there are other reasons as well. Um, again, one is, is a sexually selected trait, so a male that builds multiple nests is indicating that he's healthy and strong, uh, he's got good genetic quality. But having multiple potential nest-like structures in your territory, even if you're only nesting in one, the other nests serve as dummy nests to distract predators from being able to find your real nest, and so it may uh, reduce the chance that uh, your nest will be lost to a depredation. But if the nest is lost to depredation and you have the time to re-nest again and there's a short window, having a backup nest nearby that at least is partially finished will help to speed that re-nesting attempt up. I've got this picture here of a bucket um, with a Carolina wren nest in it. The Carolina wren nests in just about any structure that you'd put out, old shoes, old boxes, uh, they like to nest on porches and potted plants. So they, in, if you leave your garage open for too long, they'll nest inside of your garage. So um, that's just, again, part of the male strategy uh, to build multiple nests for these three reasons. All right, so do you build a new nest every year or do you reuse the nest? Well, most species do build a new nest each year. Um, there could be some structural issues with the old nests. Um, the old nest may have developed some odors that may be more likely to attract a mammalian predator. Um, old nests could build up parasites that could reduce the fitness of the young. We've already shown you how that can be a problem in uh, cliff swallow um, colonies. Some species, however, do build new nests, but what they do is they build the new nest over the old nest. 
Uh, this is seen in many raptors. Uh, eagles, osprey build these massive nests over time because they're continually adding on to last year's structure, last year's platform nest. So the capability to build a nest appears to have a pretty strong heritable basis. Um, it is innate in most species, so in captivity they can build a nest. The nest uh, structure can improve with age, and that's one of the things that a female weaver may be using the quality of the nest to judge the quality of their potential mate is if his nesting skill increases with age, an older individual has already proven himself as a high quality individual. And so there's that linkage there to sexual selection again. Um, it's interesting, we'll, we'll talk in a couple of weeks about a deviation from parental care called uh, brood parasitism where the parents actually give up all of the, the parental duties themselves and force them onto other individuals. Brown-headed cowbirds, that's the only way they reproduce. Uh, females lay the eggs into the nests of other species and it's been shown in laboratories that they have lost the genetic ability to build a nest. In captivity, they just lay their eggs on the ground. Um, if, even if they're given all possible nesting materials, they just cannot build a nest anymore. They've lost that genetic capacity. But for most species, they do, again, have a strong heritable basis for that, and it can be uh, fairly conservative. So, for example, all of the birds in the order Crassiformes are cavity nesters. Now, most of them will nest in, uh, are, are secondary cavity nesters in holes that are produced by primary cavity nesters or in some cases, uh, oftentimes, in burrows that they can excavate themselves. Swallows um, within the group show some diversity in the architectural styles that they use, and that's what this figure is showing here. Um, it shows you that there are two basic clades. So we've got this clade here that is the adherent cup nesters and the adherent dome uh, nesters with the retorts uh, being represented by this clade right here. So there's a clear phylogenetic pattern coming from a common ancestor right here where they started those uh, uh, mud nests. The other main clade shown here is uh, burrow nesters, uh, either using burrows that they actually excavate or in this other clade um, adopting cavities, so secondary cavity nesters. So clearly this, these three main types are not randomly distributed on this phylogeny, indicating that, that once a clade gets this, uh, closer related species are more likely to share the same uh, pattern. And, and similar studies have been shown to show that kind of phylogenetic conservatism in oven birds as well. Remember early in this semester we talked about um, avian diversity and the fact that m more than half of bird species are in the order Passeriformes. We were talking about potential key innovations uh, for that adaptive radiation, the success of that group. And we talked about some potential morphological features, but really one of the ones that I think uh, has played a big role is their nesting diversity. Passerines show remarkable diversity in the types of nests that they produce and the locations of nests that they can produce uh, to make them adaptive uh, and give them greater nesting success in a variety of, of environments. So it was likely a, a key innovation uh, leading to their evolutionary success. Well, most nests do uh, fail, though, in, in many cases, many species. Um, and the, the reasons why nests fail is, uh, number one, by far, is predation. Predation drives the evolution of nesting in, in most species of bird. So we'll, we'll focus on that one. But some other factors include starvation. So in bad seasons when there isn't enough food available, the, the uh, young, there may be partial or complete brood reduction, the entire nest could fail, or at least some of the nestlings starve. Uh, this would be particularly likely to occur if one of the pair, you know, biparental uh, species with biparental care, if, if mom or dad dies, the other's not likely to be able to keep up with that in certain circumstances. Um, and in a circumstance when resources are really low, uh, the nest may fail because of desertion 
this will depend a lot on the life history uh, of the bird involved. If it is a species that has the potential as an adult to live a long time, it's not going to stress itself out or put itself in harm's way for a single nest attempt because that could uh, reduce its lifetime reproductive success or its chance of even making it to the next year. And so they're likely just to bail on that season uh, and try again next season or bail on at least a, an individual nest and try to re-nest again under bad circumstances. Hatch failure uh, is also a reason why certain nests fail, uh, particularly in species that have undergone rapid reduction in their population sizes, so endangered species, sometimes show uh, problems with um, n um, egg hatching. Um, so there can be some fertility issues associated with the bad genetics associated with um, inbreeding and uh, inbreeding depression when, when you get to small numbers and also just lower uh, gene pool um, and fixing of, of maladaptive genes in, in small gene pools. And then bad weather. Sometimes you're just, your nest is in the wrong place at the wrong time. Hailstorm comes through. Uh, windstorm knocks your nest over. You know, things, things like that uh, can also lead to hatch failure. Let's look at some general patterns associated with nest success and failure. Um, tropical nests get hit hard by predators compared to temperate zone ones. And so this, this predation risk affects several aspects of the, the bird's behavior and life history. So um, here it's showing that parental activity will actually uh, increase as you go north and decrease as you go south. A lot of that is driven by nest predation risk. In, in a, a tropical setting, there's a high rate of nest predation so in that situation, boy, you don't want to be going to your nest back and forth a lot. Uh, we'll revisit that here in a minute. But that's just going to draw attention to that nest. Okay, in the temperate zone, you're, 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 the predation rate is still bad in many cases, but it's not as bad. And so there's, there's a little let up on parental activity going to the nest. And this actually drives the evolution of clutch size in these two regions. Because each nest has a hard... Uh, a, a, a pretty good chance of being depredated in the tropics, they have very small clutches. You know, two, two egg clutches is, is not uncommon compared to a comparable species in the temperate zone that may have five or six eggs in their nest. And again, that's driven by predation risk, but it's also going to affect parental activity. In the tropics, you don't want to be drawing a lot of attention to your nest, and you don't have to visit as much if you only have two eggs in there. If you have a clutch of five or six, though, boy, you're going to have to be feeding those young a lot when they hatch. But again, you can get away with that more in the temperate zone. And also think about food availability in the tropics versus the temperate zone. Yearly, I mean, the year-round availability of food is better in the tropics. But remember, one advantage of nesting in the temperate zone is this super abundance of resources that occurs in the spring and summer. Uh, because of the longer days and, and greater primary productivity. So uh, that, again, will just allow you to have a larger clutch, more food to bring to, to a larger nest, uh, and more parental activity bringing that food. So all of those things are, are woven together. A similar pattern is actually seen for similar reasons with open cup nesting and whole nesting birds. Open cup nesting species tend to have higher predation risk. They're more visible to predators. Predators can usually get better access to them. Whole nesting species oftentimes are harder to find. And even if they are found, um, you may not be able to get access to the young, um, depending on the nature of the cavity itself. And so whole nesting species tend to have much larger clutches. That requires greater parental activity. Okay, so you, we're going to be at this end of parental activity. Larger clutches need more food being brought there, but again, you can get away with it because you generally have less predation risk. Open cup nesters, you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket, literally, because there's a higher predation risk. And you want to reduce your activity to not draw as much attention to those nests um, in an open cup uh, setting. So the same basic pattern exists for open cup nesting, hole nesting, and, and tropical temperate zone 
um, species. Another general pattern is uh, there's lower nest success uh, on ground nesting species. It gets better in, in uh, shrub species and higher in trees. Uh, that's usually where you have a higher uh, reproductive success, particularly for cavity nesters, uh, but also if you can put your nest out on the ends of a branch, like in the pendulous um, and pensile nest that we talked about, so that it's less accessible to mammalian uh, predators climbing out on those branches. And then just in general, Bigger birds are going to be able to defend their nest better, and they're going to be hardier compared to uh, smaller birds. And so larger birds tend to have uh, greater nest success. All right, now the, the next thing is going to be a bit of a review. We've already talked about this, so I'm just going to kind of go through it quickly. Uh, colonial versus solitary nesting. Certainly, co colonial nests have a cost associated with potential to attract more predators uh, to a colony. Um, but again, this can be reduced in some ways by nesting in cliff faces that reduces the access of these predators to the colonies. And then there are lots of predator benefits of uh, colonial nesting. We talked about detecting the predator sooner and at a farther distance, and then uh, working together to mob that predator to drive it away from the area so it's less likely to be successful. And then if it does happen to be successful, um, and you're in a big group, you can uh, benefit from the dilution effect. Remember, the dilution effect is the idea that if you're in a larger group, your individual chance of, of being uh, depredated uh, is reduced. Okay, well then, why don't all birds nest colonially? Um, well, there are pros and cons of, of, of uh, solitary nesting as well. Certainly, there are some potential predator costs. Um, mobbing is not going to be as potential. I have it here is no mobbing. You, you're, you're not going to be able to get joined by other members of your species typically if you're in fairly large territories. But remember um, the mobbing calls produced by one species is likely to attract uh, birds of other species and they can work together to gang up on a, a, a predator to drive it from the general area of everybody's nest. Uh, the dilution effect really isn't going to benefit you that much. Uh, you're the only nest of your species in that area. Um, and you're not going to be able to detect these predators uh, at, a, at a great distance so that you're able to, to coordinate any kind of a defense uh, from, from your nest. And as a matter of fact, uh, particularly in tropical species, that puts the parents in a great threat of losing their life uh, during incubation. Well, so then that sounds all pretty bad. What about potential benefits? It all comes down to hiding from predators. Um, if the predator never sees you, you don't have to worry about mobbing. You don't have to worry about dilution to detection. You're just hiding and, and hoping not to be found. And for many birds, that works out with their the cryptic uh, nest themselves and their location of putting nests in areas where they're un, not likely to be found. If a nest is found, though, there are certain things that you can do to protect the nest. Literally attack the potential predator by yourself or mobbing with others. Or to draw its attention away from the nest by feigning injury. Um, as we see with a broken wing display of killdeer, um, some birds, uh, some sparrows will do what's called a rodent run. Where they'll run through the grass in a, a haphazard uh, kind of zigzag manner. Uh, imitating a rodent to try to, to draw the predator's attention away from where the nest is. Another thing that some species do is, is they nest near something that's dangerous. Uh, maybe a larger species of bird that is more likely to be able to fight off a predator. And in, in the process, it's also you know fighting uh, off that predator from your nest. Nesting near crocodiles, that's also a strategy used by some uh, tropical um, species or near colonies of wasps, uh, where the wasps don't bother the birds, but they might bother something like a quadamundi, or nesting in a termite mound. We'll see that, uh, remember, some of the cavity nesters would excavate in uh, termitaria. The termites eventually seal off that cavity where the bird is nesting, so it doesn't affect them, but anything that crawls on that mound is going to be attacked by the termites. 
And then finally, uh, we also talked about a dummy nest uh, as a way to protect the identity of where your real nest is uh, to a predator. So we talked about colonies oftentimes nesting in accessible areas. We also talked about putting your nest out on the tips of branches um, uh, by making them pencil or pendulous uh, to make them more inaccessible. Horned coots actually make their own little island uh, and put, put their nest on top of that to, to get it out in the water away from terrestrial predators. Um, some grebes, as I mentioned, can produce floating platforms to do the same thing. This is a species of uh, uh, oriole called a, a cacique, uh, and the yellow rump caciques kind of use a combination of these tactics to reduce predation. One is they nest on islands when they can uh, that have reduced uh, predator populations. They nest near wasp nests where they can so that if a predator does approach, uh, they're going to get the benefit of the protection from the wasps. And then they nest in colonies so that they get all those benefits of mobbing, the dilution effect, and increased detection of approaching predators. And in these colonies, they mix in dummy nests, so active and inactive nests, uh, ones that were established that year, or maybe even nests that were used in a previous year, uh, can serve as dummy nests. Here's an interesting study. Uh, done to look at predation probabilities of nests placed in different locations. There are certain locations that are just not good for putting your nest and birds can learn to avoid these uh, based on past mistakes. This is a pretty cool study where they looked at the success or failure of nest in one year you buy real birds and then they uh, went back the next year and put artificial uh, eggs, well, zebra finch eggs, but not uh, the the original bird that made that nest, their eggs, but just baited them to see if predators that were likely to attack those nests last year were more likely to come back to those nests than those that actually successfully produced young in the previous year. So if we look at the y-axis here, it's the daily predation rate uh, in this second year of this artificial study. And you see that if in the previous year that nest had failed because it had been depredated uh, when it had eggs in it during the incubation phase, yeah, it had a really high daily uh, probability of nest predation in the artificial study. Relatively high, but much lower if it in the previous year had succeeded until it got nestlings, and then the nestlings are what uh, gave it away, and the, the predator uh, uh, ate the nestlings. But nests that were successful, those that didn't get found by a predator in the previous year, had the lowest probability of detection by predators in this artificial egg year as well. So there was just something uh, inherently dangerous or safer associated with the nests uh, in each of these locations. All right, this is uh, again the, the same figure that I showed you earlier uh, talking about how parental activity around the nest can draw attention to predators and so if you have a higher predation threat you you want to kind of tone it down um, and uh, show lower activity that's true of open nesting species and tropical species and um, whole nesting species and temperate zone species tend to have lower nest predation risk and so they can afford more parental activity and again, this has driven the evolution of clutch sizes, where you're going to have a larger clutch size in these categories and a lower clutch size in these categories. And uh, additionally, high-risk nests show other patterns of, of behavior. So uh, high-risk nests tend to show incubation shifts. Next lecture, we'll talk about who actually incubates, male or female, or both. And if they both do, but they switch off in shifts, they're likely to, to go longer shifts if there's a higher predation shift, uh, and predation risk. And the reason for that is because, again, you don't want a lot of movement in and out of that nest. So just if you're on it, stay on it longer. Again, slower feeding rates of the nestlings, but if it's the female that's doing the feeding, uh, all of the incubating, sorry, then she's got to eat. And the male typically in those cases will deliver food to the incubating female, but he's less likely to do that often 
if it's a situation where there's more likely to be a higher predation risk. And that's what's shown here in this figure. If you look at the contrast between these open figures and the closed figures, well, the closed figures are cavity nesters, right? The open ones are open uh, nesting species. And you see that they have the higher predation rates and lower rates of feeding uh, the, the incubating uh, female. The cavity nesters have lower predation rates, and so they take take more food to their mate uh, during incubation. Uh, and there's even a, an, an interesting pattern within this. Notice here that these cavity nesters are non-excavating hole nesters, so secondary cavity nesters. And these are the primary cavity nesters. So it, it seems to indicate that um, secondary cavity nesters, remember, they don't have the choice always of where they're going to nest. They just have to find a cavity that's already been created for them. If you can build your cavity wherever you want, you can pick a safer location for that. And that's, that's one of the, the uh, other messages associated with this figure. So not only do you get more activity at safer nests, but safer nests can be predicted based upon what we know about primary and secondary ca cavity nesting. Um, um, options. When you do have to visit a nest to either feed an incubating a parent or to feed young, one of the things that you can do is basically be sneaky. Don't fly right up to the nest. Land nearby and then take a more circuitous route to the nest. Vary the approach to the nest every time so that you're trying not to produce a, a pattern. Lastly, on this figure, um, they've done some experiments with model predators to show how it shifts behavior of the adults. And it affects tropical species very differently from temperate zone species. So in, in a tropical species, if you show them a predator near the nest that's a potential danger to the parent themselves, the parents are likely just to abandon that nest. They say, well, sorry, uh, I'm not going to do anything. The temperate zone birds are more likely to risk it and continue nesting. Now the reason for this is potential lifespan of, of these two groups of birds. Tropical species as adults tend to live longer. So they don't want to put that long lifespan in jeopardy if they're fairly young and there's a good chance that that nest is going to be depredated anyway. They could also lose their lives. Temperate zone species don't live as long. They don't have the option of being flexible in that situation. They need to just stick with that one nesting opportunity because they may not get another. Lastly, the nest has some important, the, the architecture of the nest has some important ways that it can affect the microclimate. And this includes a water loss. A, one of the problems with an egg, uh, remember that uh, amniotic egg it has everything in it that the nestling needs to, to develop. And the only thing that is exchanged are gases, oxygen, and CO2. But in that process, they're going to lose water. And so the higher the humidity of the area, the, the less water loss and the more that albumin uh, is maintained for the developing embryo. Also, um, the warmer the nest can stay, um, the more efficient the incubation can be and the more time the individual incubating can spend off the nest before uh, the nest drops below its critical uh, thermal minimum uh, temperature. And this is a figure just showing you uh, how uh, good a nest can be. So this is looking at individual red-winged blackbirds that stayed in the nest overnight and you see that they were able to keep um, maintain a relatively low metabolic activity uh, throughout the day, fairly consistent. However, those that had to roost out in the open uh, at night had to ramp up their metabolic activity uh, compared to midday because it was just cold. Um, and so they, they weren't taking advantage of this kind of coat-like protective warmth uh, generated by whoever was incubating uh, overnight. Cactus wrens uh, face different thermal challenges at different years. They tend to have a, a pretty uh, wide um, 
breeding season. Uh, it can range much of the year. Early in the season, what they do is they place their nest entrance facing south. Uh, deserts can get very cold during the winter, and even um, during the, the summertime, they can cool off at night. Um, but, but early in the season, it can be very cold. And so when they, they, their first nesting attempts, they're having to face that thermal challenge, and so they'll place their nest facing south for two reasons. One is if a norther comes through with north winds, it, it gets the entrance facing away from that. Um, secondly, as the sun comes up in the, the late winter, it, it kind of makes an arc that's more on the south side as it goes east to west, and so they get more of that uh, so south-facing uh, sun. Now, later in the season, when it gets really hot, you want to reverse the angle of your nest entrance. You want it to face north so that you can take advantage of any north wind that may help to cool and ventilate that nest. Uh, and, and get it out of the sun as much as possible. So I also talked about uh, these mound nests that we, we can see in like these haystack uh, social weavers. Um, these are large structures with individual little apartments that are uh, set up for birds to nest in and they have a remarkable ability to uh, uh, keep the temperature steady even in the cold nights associated with uh, the deserts that they're in and the hot days associated with those deserts. Cavity nesters and burrows also, to a greater or lesser degree, have some, some more thermal inertial capabilities as well to, to not have uh, highs and low spikes. Okay, so that'll do it for, for this lecture.